Thank you, Andy. Uh, what future for traditional development agencies in the changing world? But at first sight, the future doesn't look too bright for development agencies. The Canadian CEDA is being integrated in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The Swedish CEDA has been put on a tight leash by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And I'm convinced that one of the main evolutions of the next decade will be the diplomatization of development cooperation, diplomatization for want of a better word. Development policies will increasingly be considered and used as instruments of foreign policy. Development cooperation will be further integrated into foreign policy. Foreign affairs ministries will, ex will exercise tighter control over development policies and agencies. The challenge for us will be to make sure that development cooperation becomes a true pillar of foreign policy. Now, Belgium is a mid-sized bilateral DAC donor, <coughs> which mainly works with ODA through grants. If a donor like Belgium wants to have any future at all, it will need to take four issues into account. The geography of poverty, the international context, the future of the aid effectiveness agenda, and the competition we face. Let me start with the geography of poverty. I was in New York in 2000, and I was in Monterey in 2002. And the world has changed immensely since then, with huge consequences for the business model of traditional donors. That business model is built around the concept of ODA, Official Development Assistance. As Hillary Clinton observed at the Busan Conference in December 2011, ODA represented 70%, 70 percent, 70 of capital flows going into development countries in the 1960s, and 40 years later in 2010, it was just 13 percent. And that faces us with a crucially important question. If the ODA footprint is shrinking, how can we maximize its impact? We all agree that aid on its own cannot lift countries and populations out of poverty. That is very often the first sentence in our minister's speeches. But let us not forget that there are numerous examples of countries, countries which have seen rapid aid-supported development, Western Europe after the Second World War through the Marshall Plan, South Korea in the 1960s and the 1950s and the 1960s through traditional development assistance, Central and Eastern Europe in the 1990s through the various EU accession funds. So development assistance has contributed to economic growth in quite a number of countries. And thanks to economic growth and the trade it generated, the number of low-income countries has fallen significantly from 63 in 2000 to 36 today. 63, 36. And that is very impressive indeed. In less than 15 years, the number of low-income countries has roughly been halved. And that is the reason of the shift we are witnessing in the geography of poverty. And now I lose my text. <laughs> 20 years ago, more than 90% of the world's absolute poor were living in low-income countries. And nowadays, more than 70% of the poorest people live in middle-income countries. But the 90% living in poverty in low-income countries 20 years ago and the 70% of them living in middle-income countries today are very much the same people. They didn't take a plane and leave for another country. It's the countries they were living in that graduated into middle-income countries. And in doing so, these countries lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. But a minority of their population is still living in abject conditions. More than 400 million in India, over 200 million in China, 60 million in Indonesia, 20 million in Brazil. I expect these new middle-income countries to reduce extreme domestic poverty to a very large extent over the next two decades. Economic growth and increased foreign trade will be important factors. But political and social pressure will also force these governments to mobilize domestic resources for redistribution and poverty reduction. Basically, that's what happened in Europe and in North America, in our countries in the 19th and in the 20th century. And inequality will, of course, continue to exist as it still does in Europe and in North America. But I believe that in 20 to 20 25 years' time, poverty levels in Asia and Latin America will have been reduced dramatically. And that will leave us with Africa. Not with Africa as a whole, but with a number of countries in Africa which are affected by chronic conflict, which are extremely badly governed, which are not capable or not willing to use revenue from natural resources to set themselves on the path to economic and human development. Now, I'm perfectly aware of the debate on where the poor will live in 2030, and researchers don't agree on that. But personally, 
I'm convinced that the vast majority of the poorest people will again live in the low-income countries, especially in fragile states and mostly in Africa. Countries devastated by chronic conflict or corrupted by ill-managed natural resources. In those countries, the ODA footprint will remain quite sizable. Traditional bilateral donors such as Belgium will need to focus on these countries. Other co donors will prefer to remain engaged in middle-income countries, and that's perfectly fine. We don't need everybody to do the same thing. But for a donor with the DNA of Belgium, the poorest and the most fragile countries in Africa should be the focus. That's where our added value is. The diplomatization of development cooperation is a consequence of this focus on poor and fragile states. The environment we are facing as donors in such countries is extremely complex and challenging. We will need to apply a whole-of-government approach, focusing also on peace and security, on democratic accountability, etc. Foreign policy is better equipped to address this broad range of issues than a narrow approach based on technical assistance. Finally, as Warren already said, in focusing on these countries, we will have to take into account urban development. Urbanization is an important factor in the geography of poverty. 24 out of the 30 fastest growing citizens in the, uh, cities in the world are African. More than half of Africa's population is living in urban areas. And the fastest growing city in Africa is Kinshasa. The urbanization of poverty has happened under the radar of the development community. We tend to focus on rural poverty. We have huge programs on rural development, but we have very little in the way of urban development. And as the poor increasingly live in an urban environment, we will need to rethink a lot of our portfolios. Now, over the next two years, between now and September 2015, we are going to decide what to do over the next two decades. Basically, there are two processes taking place simultaneously. The first one is the debate on the post-2015 framework and the need to merge the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals. Merging those two sets of objectives is necessary if we want to ensure that all citizens of this planet, wherever they live, can lead a prosperous and happy life, while at the same time, the regenerative capacity of the planet is not exceeded. Those of us who are in the traditional poverty reduction business will need to adapt. Our agenda will become a global agenda with sustainable human development at its core. It will not be possible for us anymore to concentrate entirely on service delivery and capacity building through technical assistance. We will have to deal with much more complex issues such as climate change, migration, trade, the business environment and the like. This post-2015 debate has a lot of political traction. It is in full swing. That cannot be said of the Global Partnership for Effective Development Cooperation, which emerged from the Busan Conference. Indeed, the Global Partnership is having difficulties to get started. If the Global Partnership doesn't get its act together soon, it may be too late, as even more attention will shift to the post-2015 framework. And that would be bad news, bad news indeed for the aid effectiveness agenda. Now, colleagues, the, the principles of the Paris Declaration were not written with the poorest, most fragile and corrupted countries in mind. At least that is my impression when I visit the countries like the Democratic Republic of Congo or Burundi and I visit those countries on a regular basis. Concentrating our efforts on the poorest and the most fragile states may set us at odds with some of the Paris principles. In my mind, the Paris Declaration suffers from two inbuilt flaws. It is so heavily focused on the recipient side of the equation that it totally neglects the need for public and political support in donor countries. The results agenda is a belated recognition of the fact that we need to show results if we want to keep support from public opinion and funding from the taxpayer. Even now, having finally recognized that we need results if we want to stay in business, we are struggling with the results concept, arguing that we should not focus on low-hanging fruit. In my mind, there is nothing wrong with low-hanging fruit. For tens of thousands of years, our ancestors have survived on low-hanging fruit. <laughs> it would be a terrible mistake if we chose to focus on the poorest and most fragile countries in order to escape the results paradigm. Public opinion would not forgive us. 
There is nothing wrong with trying to show results as long as we remain ready to take risks. And our distant forefathers perfectly understood that they couldn't live on low hanging fruit alone and they had to kill a mammoth or a bear from time to time. The second flaw in the Paris Declaration is a naive formulation of ownership based on the assumption that governments in partner countries are development maximizers. If you put enough ODA at their disposal, preferably in the form of budget support, they will use it wisely for the development of their country and their population. And we all now realize that is not true. Mutual accountability, therefore, in my opinion, is the most important of the Paris principles. That principle needs to guide us in the future. Accountability towards public opinion and parliaments in donor countries, and that means showing results and crafting smart conditionalities. And accountability towards public opinion and parliaments in partner countries, and that means strengthening local civil society, organizations, parliaments, universities, the media, etc. Colleagues, let me, to conclude, talk about the competition. For decades, ours was the only show in town. As ODA was supplying more than half of the financial flows to partner countries, we could pretty much do as we pleased. That is not the case anymore. There is competition, there is choice, and we should welcome that. Poverty reduction is not the only challenge anymore. The Millennium Development Goals were the apex of the poverty reduction agenda. But 15 years on, other issues have forced themselves on that agenda. Climate change, global public goods, peace and security, demography and migration, access to water. For too long, the development community has ignored these new challenges, arguing that financial means to address them should be separate and additional. That was very naive. We have now come to realize that all these challenges are poverty related. Not acting on the environment will have a devastating effect on poverty, as the latest human development report by UNDP has shown. The only way to ensure that poverty eradication remains at the top of the post-2015 agenda is to recognize these challenges and to use part of ODA to address them. And finally, bilateral donors are also faced with competition from large non-governmental actors, from vertical funds, from philanthropists, from some of the countries which until recently were aid recipients such as Brazil or South Korea, and of course from China. In this new aidscape, there is a future for all of these new entities, whether we think of them as donors or not. But there is also a future for us as well. We should be impressed by these emerging donors, but not intimidated. We should learn from them. We can learn from the private sector about efficiency. We can certainly learn a thing or two about ownership from emerging donors. But we should not try to copy them. The future for traditional donors, such as Belgium, is in being distinct from non-traditional donors. Values of human rights, democrat democratic governance, must continue to underpin our commitment. Addressing inequality and social injustice through forces of change must remain at the heart of our efforts. In pursuing results, we must remain willing to take risks. If we do that, if we stick to our DNA, we will remain <coughs> relevant for as long as it takes to eliminate poverty. Thank you. Peter, thank you very much. That was a, a wonderful overview of how it, um, how it looks from your perspective and a, a very strong and persuasive case for what, um, if you like, holding steady to certain aspects of the tradition in the face of a, a very rapidly changing environment. Now, Romilly's going to speak largely, I think, to research which looks at the country-level picture. 